Yeah, welcome to the first panel of the day. Uh, it's, the topic is pretty broad, uh, the digital playbook. We're going to focus really, uh, I guess you could say, the first couple of chapters of that playbook on digital strategy, um, defined as the choices companies make about where and how to compete in, a big, uh, in the face of a big disruptive economic force called digital. Um, every company on earth is digitizing. Not every company on earth has a coherent uh, digital strategy. And we're very fortunate to have uh, two folks here who can talk deeply about things that their organizations are doing uh, to respond strategically to, to digital. Uh, John Carnahan from Ticketmaster and Jim Wethrick from Warner Brothers. Um, as we get started, uh, just to sort of gauge where the audience is, would be curious uh, to kind of take your temperature. If your organization has you feel a coherent digital strategy about where and how to compete in the face of digital, please applaud. <laughs> and if not, please uh, boo. <laughs> OK, a mixture as always. So the, it's going to be great to hear from John and Jim. Um, I suggest we uh, start out just by hearing a bit uh, from each of you about what aspects of digital strategy you're responsible for at your organizations and, uh, and what you're trying to do. Uh, John, you want to start? Sure. Um, hi. Uh, I'm in charge of the engineering uh, related to Ticketmaster's data assets is the best way to put it. So chief data officer, um, started five years ago at Ticketmaster. It was just me coming in from ad tech industry into Ticketmaster. Completely didn't know anything about live event industry. Um, it's grown to about 150 people, data scientists, engineers, all dedicated to um, you know, making people not hate Ticketmaster. <laughs> uh, say a little, why, why do people hate Ticketmaster? <laughs> the live event industry, everybody loves live events, right? Everybody loves attending, everybody loves the fact, you know, it's, it's like Christmas when you get a ticket to a show that you know, is sold out and that you really want to see. The worst part of that experience is buying the ticket, right? Nobody wants to rush in at an on sale that's been marketed and come in and, and fight with everybody to get a ticket and you come in, you can't get a ticket, you end up going to some other marketplace and it's five times, ten times as expensive and everybody blames Ticketmaster for that. So it's, and we're the worst part of something that everybody loves. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, <laughs> at a company that makes products that everyone loves. Right, um, well, <laughs> yes, they love most of the products we make, and so if they're angry at us, it's not about necessarily getting access, it's actually what the product is in the end, and uh, we love our fans, and our fans are, are very passionate about the products that we make. So I'm at Warner Brothers. Within Warner Brothers, we have a couple of different uh, uh, divisions and responsibilities. We've, we've got a group that makes the films, we've got a group that makes the television, and then we have a group that distributes it uh, into the world. And I'm in that distribution arm of it, so I'm in home entertainment. Um, I'm sure some of you guys uh, have heard of DVDs. Uh, it's an uh, ancient technology, but uh, we still sell a lot of them. Uh, and what I like to call it is bits on disk. Uh, so we still sell a lot of those, but uh, we also have moved into the modern age and we sell a lot of our content through digital platforms such as iTunes, Google, Amazon, um, Comcast, you, you name the digital platform, that product gets there. So my group's responsible for making that product come into the home on a global basis. Great. And so two interesting strategic problems, one being hated, the other being <laughs> uh, <laughs> disrupted by people who are distributing. Hated might be a little too strong. So how, how, are you, how are you tackling uh, th that? And, and how, how do you think your degrees of freedom, uh, strategic degrees of freedom, have expanded with, with digital in recent years? Um, I, the, the problem really is that uh, in, the, in the world of live events, the, it's just not an efficient marketplace, right? The, the pricing is wrong. Um, and what that means is that, that the artists or the, or the venues have a specific goal in mind of why they're setting that price, and there's lots of reasons why they might set a price below what the market value is. It might be, it might be the Bruce Springsteen's of the world that, that there's no way they want to charge more than 50 bucks for a show at Madison Square Garden, right? He wants to do that. Even though he knows it's worth 500 bucks, he wants to make sure that he does it. So the challenge is you have this massive arbitrage opportunity in the, in the, in the secondary market I think the, the way I described it is the, it's the most, um, it's the largest fully accepted black market in the world, right? That everybody just, it's fine. You have the drug trade, you have stolen content, but 
you know, everybody knows that those things are illegal, but it's not illegal to resell tickets. So it's, it's trying to use our data, our assets, and the fact that our, our fans really love these live events to, to try to either claw back some of that arbitrage opportunity and put it back in the hands of the, in, into the hands of the fans, into the hands of the artists, um, as well as um, try, to, try to solve the inherent problem, which is really about identity, right? You know, the, if you bought a ticket for an airline and you tried to sell that to somebody else and that person tried to go into that airport and try to enter that plane, they'd be arrested, right? You can't do that, right? But, uh, and that's really because the identity of that ticket is tied to that person. In the live event industry, it's not. So that's the real, um, I think that's part of handling this arbitrage opportunity. So for, for us in my group at Warner Brothers, we're probably the poster child for uh, disruption, right? We're, Warner Brothers has been around for nearly 100 years. We create content. We, uh, create incredible film, we can create television, and we also have a big game division. So we're creating content. In most of those models, the business model has been predicated on what we call windows. It's when content is made available distinctly in different parts that you can get access to it. So on the film side, everybody's familiar with this. It starts with uh, theater. We, we, we uh, put a lot of money into creating the product, we ramp up our marketing groups, and we spend a lot of money to get you all excited about it to go out and see it uh, in opening weekend in a theater. And it goes to the theater, and generally most of the films last in, the, in that window for probably four to, to five weeks. You can still find it in theaters, but then it goes dark for a while <coughs> before my group picks it up which is in home entertainment. And that's about you know, three months into it. And then we make it available on the digital platforms and we put it on those bright, shiny disks um, and, and make them available to people. And then after that, eventually, they end up in HBO and the, and the pay window and such. So it was a beautiful business model. We were able to monetize each section of that. Well, the world's changed now. There's internet and there's direct access to everything. And on top of it, there's an expectation that if the product is made, why can't I have it now? Why can't I have access to it right now? So um, there's, there's a, a cultural shift that's happened that the business model hasn't kept up with. And so uh, I, I had an interesting experience recently with uh, one of my teenage sons. I said, well, let's go see a movie this weekend. And he looked at me and he's like, really? I said, yeah, let's go see a movie. He says, well, it's kind of a hassle to get out of the house and go see a movie. He said, <laughs> he said all right, I'll go, but tell your peers at the office I did them a favor. He's spending my money to go to a movie and I'm doing him a favor. So that gives you context of the challenge for this new audience that's coming up and how do we, how do we adapt to that? How do we change our business model? It's very expensive to make this product. It's not inexpensive. And, and even with this windowed model, which has allowed us to optimize the revenue across the, the, the scheme, it's still hard to make money on most of the product we do. Um, so that's, that's our disruption cha challenge right now. We've got an old business model, a new world, and people have access to it, and, and how, do we, how do we bridge that gap? So if you've got people who in the future may not want to go to movies like your son, and then you've got the DVD market being disrupted, it, 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 is there a, a money-making position for you in the middle there? That yes, we're still making money, so that's the good news. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, and, and, and we're making movies, and, and, and the disruption isn't all bad. It does create opportunities. The, the challenge for incumbent companies is, is finding those opportunities and making those transitions fast enough so that you can keep the wheels on, the, the, in our case, the content that you're actually making, and, and that's what we're trying to do. So, we're looking at uh, uh, any number of things to, to try to speed up the process. And what's been happening over time is the home entertainment window um, has been shrinking. It used to be four months, just say five years ago, and now that's now, now down to three months. So, so that window's getting closer together. There's a lot of discussion in the press uh, recently around what we call day and date. That means making a film available in your home very uh, almost simultaneous when it's going into the theater. Because it's a real interesting problem. We'll spend you know, a lot of money to get people excited about our next film that's coming up. 
And then we constrain demand. We, we send them through, you say, you gotta go to a theater in, in order to experience this. And, and I personally believe that through that process, we're losing lots of people. Now eventually it'll come into the home and everybody understands that because people understand the business model has been happening for a long time. But that excitement, that interest that we generated at the beginning, um, it kind of wanes over time. And we can't spend the same amount of money once we get into the home entertainment window to completely rekindle that interest. So there's a lot of discussion going on about is there a way to, to better optimize that time uh, between those areas. And, and what we try to do is we try to have as many business models and as many, and I call them business models, you might as a consumer call it access points in order to get the content. You, you have a myriad of ways to watch a, a Warner Brothers movie. So you can go to theaters, or you can watch it in home entertainment, and you can buy the disc, you can buy it digitally, you can rent it in both physical and digital. And if you want, you can go to those lovely red kiosks that you see in front of a lot of stores, red box, um, and you can rent it for a very reasonable price. So we have many different ways that you can access it. And if you're not satisfied with any of those, wait a couple of months and it's gonna be on HBO. Uh, and it's part of your subscription. It's funny, that, that brings up, a, sorry, um, brings up another point. Um, when I came to Ticketmaster five years ago, uh, you know, the, when I asked my family, you know, should I do this, it's, it's very different than the world I came from. Um, the, somebody gave me some wise advice that the live event industry is the last thing that can't be stolen in the entertainment world, mm -hmm. right? And if you, if you just sit back and do nothing, chances are that industry is just going to hockey stick, right? As, as media itself gets cheaper, um, the, the drive towards more live events is going to come from the artists themselves, right? Because that's the main way that they can make money, right? So it's, you know, there's more festivals, there's more, there's more science behind them growing their audience, and there's more, um, there's really just more demand for this. But the, the thing that that I struggle with as part of Ticketmaster is um, that just means more competition, right? That just means there's a lot more people in that space because there's a lot more money to make and how does Ticketmaster respond to that? So it's a, it's a slightly different problem. In, in my case, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, oh shit, this industry is really, is really uh, accelerating, but at the same time, we have to keep up. We have to be able to, to satisfy that demand in a way that, that um, you know, make sure that our customers don't want to go somewhere else. So, so what's interesting about that, I'm basically in the recorded business, right. you're in the live entertainment business, but this, the, the area that we're in is entertainment, yeah. right? And, and the biggest competition that we have is time, people's time, ultimately is what it comes down to. And, and, get, and getting people, you know, getting attention. And because of all the changes with the technology and such and social media and, 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 and people creating their own content, Vijay had spoke of, you know, about Snap um, and kids spend a heck of a lot of time on that. On, on uh, Google, YouTube, a tremendous amount of viewership time has now gone to that. It's gone away from what we call professional content. And so a big part of our challenge in this disruptive world is how do we get people's attention again? How, how do we make it relevant? Right, and, and the people that I'm most worried about in my industry, sure, I'm worried about the, you know, the, the big players, the Amazons of the world, but the ones that I'm really scared about are the ones who are going towards that type of content, right? It's the, it's the smaller guys that are going after, you know, you might say birthday parties, but it's more likely the, the smaller festivals, right? Because they're able to, um, you know, it takes sort of the Apple approach, right? If you get them when they're young and you get them attached to your brand, when even if it's a small thing, then they're going to be more likely to uh, come back to you later on. I want to ask more about uh, competition. Before doing so, I think there's a question over here. Uh, do you want to? All right. No? Okay. Yeah. Gideon, Corey, Trance. We're talking about innovation this conference, and it looks like there is a common ground between both of you. Uh, Ticketmaster focuses on live event, and, and, and Warner Brothers focuses on recorded media, but there are innovators out there which are coming from a very unusual place, like Metropolitan Opera, who does digital transmission of the events around the world, and wouldn't that address the demand kind of a challenge that Ticketmaster facing if Ticketmaster tomorrow will start to say, hey, uh, you still want to see it? No problem, you can see it digitally. 
And would it address uh, Warner Bros. challenge that, just like your son, my daughter doesn't want to go to the theater, but she'll be gladly having a party with six friends at home watching on live with popcorn, pizza, and, and, and beer delivered. So you bring a movie theater into home rather than trying forcing the new generation to go. So it looks like there's a lot of synergy, and I'm surprised that the innovators come from Metropolitan Opera and not from Warren Brothers and Ticketmaster. I, I think that's additive. Um, I, I think, you know, I, it's hard for me to speak for uh, a, a younger generation, but um, I, the, the demand for live events has only accelerated, right? And I think that's because, in a lot of ways, the convenience of recorded entertainment, right? If they are going to go out, they're not going to go out to see another recording, you know? They're not, if they can see it at home, you know, why go out and see a movie? The only reason they would go out, right, is to really experience something. And, and if you go to a live event, it's really not to see what's on stage. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. It's really just to be there, right? To be part of that experience, to be with the other people. I mean, if you, if you went and you know, saw Kanye West on stage, you know, if he actually showed up, the, <laughs> <laughs> that, that if you were the only person in the audience and he was entertaining you, it'd be a terrible experience. It'd be an awful experience, right? People don't watch Kanye West videos. They go to his shows because he's going to do something outrageous. He's going to do something outrageous with the audience. The audience is going to do something outrageous. People go to EDC, absolutely not for the music, right? <laughs> they, don't go to, they don't go there at all for that. They go for that experience. And that's the part that's accelerating. So I think what you're describing is, is really additive. I think there's room for all of this. I think the, the hunger for entertainment, because it is so convenient, that part is accelerating. And I think it's just because of the, the ease of use. You know, you have you know, intimate computing. You can always look at your phone. You can always look at recordings on your phone. It's just all the time. So I think the demand is just increasing. I think Metropolitan Opera is just riding that wave as well. And, and I would add to that, just even in, in the film space, there is a place for theater. Um, and there are, there are many who would much prefer to see a movie in the theater with other people. There's a social element to it, and a lot of the filmmakers are very passionate about this to get that interaction that's happening in the theater. And this is the positive interaction that can happen in a theater where people are laughing and they're, they're experiencing um, this very emotional piece of work all at the same time. You can't get that when you're sitting in the home necessarily. So, and even for my kids, that example I gave, he was doing me a favor by going out. The next night, he was going out, but he was going out with his buddies, right? So there's a social component to going out to the theater, which is what John is touching on, that you can't replicate in the home. So even though we can make this stuff more available uh, to people, it doesn't replace that experience that That's you're right. taking away from it. It just, to your point, it's additive and it should grow on top of it. Now, the reason why a lot of this, this innovation doesn't happen very quickly, and this is part of the innovator's di dilemma, this, this is why disruption is hard because it changes business models. Our, our theater partners, our exhibitor partners have invested a lot of money in bricks and mortar in creating these theaters. They have a business model that works for them. When, when something comes in to change that business model, it creates friction because nobody really knows what's gonna happen ultimately if the, if the window creeped up in it. And so people are looking out for their best interests. So that's fine and, and we understand that that's the hard part of this. The, the part that we need to look at as people who are kind of managing this, this side of the business and, and strategy is that in the end, it really doesn't matter about that structure. It matters what the fans want, what the consumers want, and how they want to access the content. Um, because the barriers have been, knocked, have been knocked down for better or for worse. And I think overall, it's always for a, a, a better but it, it's just part of the change. And so you've got to adapt and try to do it. And Vijay said, you know, you've got to keep fighting. That, that's what it is every day. There's, there's constant friction in it because the model, consumers, how they're accessing the content itself, all of that is changing, and it's trying to roll along with that. Yeah, we, 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 and, and to, be, to be fair, in the innovation of that space, you know, Ticketmaster is actually part of Live Nation, and Live Nation has done incredible innovation in that space. I mean, you know, 360 cameras at, at events and recording those things and broadcasting. We, have, we broadcast a, a, a concert a day 
on Yahoo, right? And there's a lot of demand for it. I mean, people will watch it, but it hasn't decreased at all the, the need for you know, a, a really good live event experience. So we'd love to hear a little more about the changing nature of competition from your vantage point. Well, how has digital uh, shifted your competitor set uh, in the bigger context of this notion of competing for people's time? Well, you know, again, I'm point to BJ. He started right up there with it, and he had um, Netflix up there. Netflix, uh, interestingly, started the company about the time that I joined Warner Brothers, and you know that was almost 20 years ago. And I and I knew the Netflix guys, and they came knocking on the door, and they said, you know what, we're going to start this DVD by mail thing. Uh, it's a rental company, and we all looked at them. It's kind of interesting, I guess. Um, and they said, hey, uh, can can we ride in your DVD so we can tell people about this service? I said, no, that's not going to work so good because if it's at Target and Walmart, I don't think they want a competing service in there. But you know, you guys keep working at it. And over the time. You know, the DVD thing really started taking off. It was subscription by mail. People loved it because all of a sudden you didn't have these late fees and it was convenient. It showed up at your door and it was very quickly. And, and Reed and, and crew really optimized that model. Then they shifted over to the digital piece of it and they started getting content in there and they discovered a whole new uh, audience, which was people love television content and they love binge watching television content. It, 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 was a, it was a whole new use case. The studios, we didn't have any place to sell that old TV content anymore because there was only so many cable channels that you could put it on and the stuff was out there. Um, but once it went on Netflix and people started rediscovering some of that, that old TV content and really getting into it, it created a whole new marketplace. So that sprung up and it happened very quickly. Where Netflix, so, so Netflix, this is co-optition, right? Because Netflix, on one hand, is a big customer of ours. They buy a lot of our content and they put it in there, and, and that's a good thing. Where it's not so good is people are spending so much time on Netflix now that they're not spending time on what we call the premium stuff. So it's the first run. So it might be a first run television show, or it might be a first run movie, or even some of our video games. It's because it's become the go-to de facto place to say, okay, I just want to get entertained, so sit down, what can I find on, on, on Netflix and go to it? And that's where the competition for us has really started to come in, because it's really about people's time. Yeah, and, and one, oh, before I answer the question, we'll probably have to repeat it, but, um, about Netflix, I think Netflix was a, was a, was a, did an incredible transformation. And the way that they leveraged, you know, how many people here have heard of the Netflix prize? A couple people, handful of people. That was revolutionary in machine learning. I mean, the fact that, that um, I think it, it was the single most important event in the last decade or so that attracted machine learning people to this type of problem, which is, which is recommendation systems. Mm -hmm. And what Netflix did was, I, I don't think they realized they were doing it. I think they just really wanted to build a better recommendation system for, for this digital content. But what they did to themselves was they revolutionized themselves by, you know, you had this great user to content matrix that you know, showed the affinities for each user to each, each piece of content that they could leverage. But, but in, in as, their, as their growth declined, right, as, as they went through that little trough that they went through, all they did was invert that matrix. All they did was a, a transpose of that matrix, which then said, um, wow, instead of recommending content to people, let's figure out what content people really want to watch based off the information that we have. Because now we have this massive amount of content that was a big part of what they did in the Netflix prize. And they turned that into gold. You know, they found, wow, people really like lesbians. People really like prison shows. Let's create Orange is New Black. <laughs> it, was, it was genius. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and and I, think, I think Netflix uh, was, was transformative. And, and, and the reality came from was really in the machine learning community. Them, machine learning community really embracing what the problem that they had to do. And as companies, if you can get that, if you can get that hacker community to embrace what you're doing and to help you, I mean, there's no bigger benefit to whatever revolution you're trying to... So, so this, this, is, this is where that wasn't we're going to start, no, no, but I, I we're gonna gonna start go talking about go. this is where AI starts writing yeah, scripts, yeah. right? Yeah. That's going to yeah. get kind of well, suffering. Well, let's, let's continue with machine learning and AI. Yeah. Cause this is, I, this, so you're using machine learning to try to tackle that identity problem you described, yes. right? And, and I know you, you guys also. Let's talk, I think this is a useful line of discussion. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, 
Uh, then I won't answer your last question. Then. Forget but, uh, it. Not a good question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 the identity problem is um, when, it, when it comes to live events, the, the, the marketplace is a really strange one. You have fans that want to get access to tickets. And then you have the artists that want to get access to fans. Right? That's really the two big players in there. You have the venues as well, right? The venues also want people to come in the venues. So, you know, it should be a, a perfect marketplace. But the problem is that you have, um, you have an intermediary in there, right? An intermediary that's anonymizing the system, right? That's, that's taking the identity out of both the ticket, right? And out of the fan himself. So, so the, the better that we can get at recognizing fans and being able to determine you know, the likelihood that somebody's going to buy a ticket and attend a show, right? that, that affinity, that, that strength of, of how that fan really wants to, is associated with that event, the, the better we can serve everybody involved in there except for that intermediary. So that's a big part of where we're really applying uh, machine learning to is, is how, can we, how can we make that more predictive given that the, the disruption in the marketplace is going to be hard to do on pricing because of the Bruce Springsteen problem. It's going to be hard to reprice it. We're, we're definitely trying to do that as well. But what we're focusing on is how do we collect information, um, believe it or not, from users. It's, it's usually a dirty word, but in the case of live events, if somebody wants to go see Adele, they're willing to give us DNA, right? If, if it gives them a better chance of getting tickets, they'll be happy to. Um, so it's, it's, it's taking that information and trying to you know, really give them a better chance to sit in the front row, right? If, if you're the biggest Adele fan, and we know that based off of the data that we have, right? We should be able to put you in front row because that's what Adele wants, that's what the venue wants, that's what the fan wants. Yeah. So, so that, that, you know, you guys are in an in a advantageous space because you get at least that initial transaction so you know who's buying it. You lose it after and it gets into the tertiary market and right. when things in the secondary market and when it starts happening. Warner Brothers, our business is predicated on selling through a distributed network. So we generally are not the ones who are selling it to you. And that has become a problem for us in the content community. Um, that's a big advantage for these SVOD platforms, be it Netflix or Google or Amazon, because they're getting data that is not public. We don't see what the viewing habits are. We don't see the connections that they're actually making. And so that has put us at a, at a disadvantage, and, and we're, we've been trying to figure out how we collect more of that information. And, and what we want it for is, is, is for twofold. Um, as there is a proliferation of more and more content and, and people's time is being taken up by other things, we want to make it relevant to the consumers. We want them to find content that we know they'll be interested in. That's a key part of it. It's discovery. It's getting content and in, in, through a marketing perspective, trying to get the word out, knowing that you would like this product. So we are building uh, DMPs, um, these big data uh, um, a system so that we know what content people are watching across the spectrum where we can collect it. So we'll put a trailer up on, on YouTube or we'll put it up on our own sites and we'll see the engagement and how people watch it and such. And then we'll collect that information um, and it's anonymized. We don't know who you are specifically, but we know you're interested in this content. So then we can go down as we go through our window process, we can present that product to you and tell you that it's available in that space. We haven't been able to solve for this, this issue around in, in the content creation as much as some of these platforms have, have done. And that's, that's one of the problems we're trying to solve for is how do we get more of that data? So is the bottleneck, for both of you, is the bottleneck the data or the capability of the algorithm to process the data and give you the answers you're looking for? Uh, for, for us, it's the data. Um, um, I think the, the problem is the attendance. You know, you can predict who's going to buy a ticket, but it's much harder to predict who's going to attend an event because most people who go into a live event still use a paper ticket, right? So you don't know, if you have a paper ticket, you don't know who sold that ticket. Um, and so collecting that, collecting you know, the, the labels to your, to your model that you're trying to build, that you're trying to build this, this uh, nice predictive model for, it doesn't work if the labels aren't there. So, um, I think that's our biggest limitation right now, and that's something we're trying to address. We have 
products that are um, that enable you to use a device, right? To, to go in and it knows who you are. And if you use that device, it's going to give you a much better chance of getting tickets further on, right? So there's an incentive there for the venues because the venues know now who's in the venue, right? If it's you know a VIP, they can they can treat you differently. They can try to sell you you know, a beer, a Coke, whatever it is. It's great for them, it's great for the artists because now they know also who their fans are. And for the fans, you know, we can use that same data set to um, give them a better chance next time. It, yeah, I'd say for us it's a combination. Um, it's A, getting access to the data and then the analysis on it. We can figure that part of it out. So, uh, but it's, it's really a combination. We, we have launched our own uh, apps and such. Say we've got a, an app just around DC. DC is one of our biggest properties and you can go uh, download it on your iTunes or, or Android device, DC All Access. And the amount of fans that are coming into that and what we learn from that um, is tremendous. And then it's taking that information that we're learning from all of these data points that we have and then trying to build that back into the product itself. As, as we were talking outside before we came in here, I said, you know, people can either love you or hate you in the content business. And, and it's that passion that makes this business so special. So when Batman versus Superman came out last summer, there were a lot of detractors against that. I mean, it was a financial success. We did over $800 million in box office, but people really care about those characters. It's, it's part of who they are, and so they have an opinion about it. And, and as, as an organization, we have a responsibility to, to nurture that and try to make it right for that fan base. But that's that passion that we want to, we want to tap into. And we, when we take that feedback into the next product that we put out, so I think you'll see uh, as more and more of these movies come out, um, we're listening to fans. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on the earlier uh, talk, you know, with the open source community and with AWS, um, you know, the algorithms really aren't a problem. I mean, you know, TensorFlow is open source, right? Um, you know, Valpal Wabbit is, you know, state of the art for doing prediction. You have, you know, it's easy to spin up a 200 node Spark cluster in AWS and run an iterative algorithm that, you know, would, you know, blow the socks off of anything that we did five years ago. It's just too easy. You know, it's it's almost um, you know it's almost dangerous, right? You can you you know it's it's the, the machine learning now is is and oftentimes I'll I'll get beat up for this, but it's it's less about the science, it's more about the art form and you know the feature engineering, having the right objective function, getting the right data, getting enough data. Once you have that in place, there's so many options. If if you know somebody who, who knows enough to be dangerous with those tools, you can do a lot of very interesting things. Excellent. I didn't understand half those algorithm, uh, acronyms, so I'm going <laughs> to turn to the audience and see if there are uh, questions. We just got a few minutes left. Uh, yeah. Adrian Kearns with Magenic. Uh, Jim, you mentioned building mobile apps to provide content directly to viewers, and the technology is available for content creators to reach like the end viewers directly need for middlemen. Do you see a future that doesn't include middlemen like movie channels or Netflix or Amazon? No, I, I don't see a future where there's not an aggregator, um, and, the, and I'll tell you why. Um, so there's so much content out there, and it's created from so many different places. If you just look at Hollywood from a movie studio perspective, we view that there's six majors. If you ask people um, what say where Batman versus Superman, which studio has that, um, you would probably find out that most people don't actually know what studio it comes from. So there, there's an aggregation function that happens. People just want to go see movies and then find it. Now, if you're a hardcore DC fan, no problem. You're going to know. And we can have that direct connection. But we deal in a mass market. And since we deal in a mass market, there, there is a need somewhere in there for an aggregator. Having said that, there is real opportunity for more of a one-to-one -one connection with some key properties and the studio and, and, and the creators of the content, and that's what we're working on. We're trying to build that pipeline. And it's the same thing for ticketing as well. I mean, the, we sell through lots of distribution channels, and that's part of our overall strategy is, is, to, put, is to put what distribution channel a ticket gets sold through um, make that part of our operating business, right? That, that artists themselves can say, you know, I want to sell these tickets at this price on Groupon. I want to sell these tickets at this price through Facebook. I want to sell, you know, 
they should be in complete control over that. And so Ticketmaster shouldn't be the, the channel. It'd just be, it would just be a scapegoat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got about a minute left. Uh, if there's another question, we can take it. If not, I'm, yeah, okay. How has the digital transformation um, changed the balance of power between the content creators and the distribution network? You know, there's, there's this, this endless, you know, debate, is content king or is distribution king, right? And it just depends on where you are, I think, in the, in the life cycle at any given time. Um, distributors have great power. There, there's no doubt about it. Um, but in the end, it comes down to the content. You know, we, we had talked a lot uh, earlier about where our competitors are and where they come from. In the end, there's only one Batman. There is only one Harry Potter, and Warner Brothers has that. So if we do our job well, if we create great product, and we can connect that with a fan base, people are going to find it, and they're going to want it. So that usurps the, the, the distribution piece of it. So I've made my bet. I'm on the content side of the business. I think that uh, ultimately that, that has the most sway because of that. And I, same thing in, in ticketing as well. If, as, uh, as the distribution channel broadens, right, it's, it's the artist who really controls that. Right? It's, not the, it's, not the, it's not the venue anymore. Um, the artist gains more control as, as the distribution network becomes more complex. And I think that's all, just, that's all just tech, right? That's just technology to make that possible. Maybe that's a happy note to end on. Content is still king, and we can get it when and <laughs> where we want it. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.